When you know that you are queer, but your favorite drink is beer, that's gayish. You can bottom without stopping, but you can't stand going shopping, that's gayish. Oh, gayish, you're probably gayish. Well, life's just too short for narrow stereotypes, so oh, it's gayish. We're also gayish. It's gayish with Mike and Kyle. Hello, everyone in the podcast universe. This is Gayish, the podcast with an honorary master's in toning and boning. <laughs> <laughs> oh no <laughs> what what at the same time oh i've seen those porns that's like oddly s- scary and sexual <laughs> like sex on halloween <laughs> i'm mike johnson i'm kyle Gatz. we're here to bridge the gap between sexuality and actuality and today hey mike hey, kyle you know where i got my honorary masters from where fartmouth university <laughs> Fart mouth? Yeah. Oh, God. Wait, you know where else I got it from? Where? Unifer- Unithirsty of Southern California. <laughs> <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Okay, okay. Do you know where else? Wait, where? How many degrees do you have? Puke University. <laughs> oh, God. Wait, wait, wait. wait. <laughs> MITTs. <laughs> Hardford. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> oh, Jesus. How long have you been holding on to those? Uh... What I was doing when I was sitting down on the ground, mm-hmm. that's uh, that literally was 15 minutes of work. I think it was wasted. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just like anyone who got a master's. Okay, so <laughs> today we're going to talk about Go-Go Boys. Today we're going to talk about Go-Go Boys. And we have a real-life Go-Go Boy or ex-Go-Go Boy that is going to come on and talk about his experiences Go-Going. Yeah, he's a went-went boy. <laughs> <laughs> we woke him up. <laughs> Before he went, went. Um, but first. But first. Uh, correction. Ooh. When I was talking about that guy with the giant dick that was shoplifting, mm-hmm. you said, I said that he, he said that he had to roll up his dick and you were like, like a fruit loop. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So my brother wrote in to say that you said fruit loop when you probably meant fruit by the foot or a fruit roll up. I absolutely meant fruit by the foot or I could have gone with uh, that bubble tape gum. Do you remember that from back in the day? No, we were we were too poor to for trash. <laughs> oh, don't I don't Okay, that doesn't make logical sense, but I'll let you have it because it, <laughs> because I want to talk about Oh wait, was that the only correction? Yeah, that was it. Okay. Um I want to say thank you to Patreon members. Uh Fred McDowell. McDowell? Andy McDowell's brother? Yes. Andy McDowell's <laughs> brother who is even more uh, better character actor, so much so that no one knows who Fred really is. <laughs> um, thanks, Fred. Thanks, Fred. Uh, Christopher Leary. Leary. And- we had. A, did you did you have Cyrus O'Leary's where you are? Is that just that a Spokane is. thing? There was this Irish bar in in Spokane called Cyrus O'Leary's, and it was just like nominally Irish. You like, think that that weird Spokane bar is a chain? <laughs> I thought I thought it was. Oh, really? It's, I mean, it's too cool to be a Spokane idea. Oh, just like Christopher Leary. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and they get a Sam Forbes. Sam Forbes? Okay. Um, Sam Forbes of the we, Forbes Fortune yeah, do, 400. Okay. Uh, in retrospect, all we do is point out the most obvious thing about people's names that they've been hearing all the time. Yeah, but Sam Forbes, he should probably donate more. That's a rich family. Hey, Sam. Thanks for your money. Talk to your parents about giving us more. Um, Tubes, threebs, forbs, fives. <laughs> okay, that's more original. Okay, great. Cyrus O'Leary has a restaurant in Spokane and a pie shop in Airway Heights, but it's not really a chain. That's pretty, like, family-owned. And Airway the, Heights? We the, used to drive to Airway Heights fucking wasted to go to Denny's. I uh, remember when D&D was drinking and driving. Yeah. <laughs> but back in my... No, I never did that. Um, also, before we jump into it, I want to say thank you to Ryan in our Facebook group who posted... He he drew pictures of us. Oh, yeah. Before he knew what we looked like. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And posted them to the Facebook group. It was hilarious. Mine was surprisingly accurate. I'm weirdly attracted to the picture of almost me, and I don't want to <laughs> talk about it. I'm, I, I'm a bone to pick. Yeah? Can you not hear my hair? You talk so much about <laughs> how you can't grow hair. I'm not on my su- face. The, his picture, I had facial hair and no hair on my head. Well, maybe he forgot. Maybe he thought when you can't, said you couldn't grow a beard, maybe he thought you meant a head beard. 
head beard. <laughs> your what is your hair but a beard for the head? I agree. Um, no, the pictures were really great. I really, I, yeah. th- I thought it was an awesome experiment too, it to was, be like. What do we? What do we sound like? We look like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if anyone else has not seen what we look like, please send in drawings because it's hilarious. Don't cheat either. We'll know. I don't know how, um, but we will. Okay. Uh, news? news. You want to do some news? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. So first of all, the very first Chick Fil A in the UK opened last week. And it is already closing. Goodbye. Because of immense pressure from LGBT rights groups, which, unlike the United States in the UK, if you bitch enough, shit changes. Hmm. Um, so Yes, the UK, the model for every country currently. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, and thank you for uh, sending in how it's pronounced. It's pronounced Reed Fling is <laughs> the location that that happened in. Yeah, the Chick Fil A was in Reading, and it, it's pronounced Reed Fling. Great, great, yeah, great, yeah. I don't know. Quote: The individual franchises may have differing views to the family that own the company, but the profits that are made are used towards anti-LGBT plus activities, including conversion therapies and lawmaking in Uganda, where officials want to kill the gays. Hey. No, that was the um. Uh, snapping is millennial clapping. Oh, okay. Um, All right. <laughs> I don't know if you knew that. Um, yeah, it's... Uh, your money is still c- funding terrible, horrible atrocities. Yep. It sure is. Hope that chicken is worth it. It's not. It's <laughs> um, okay, second of all... You ready for the next story? Yeah. So a school district in Pickens County, Georgia... It's pronounced... Uh, <laughs> pronounced reed fling <laughs> um recently uh changed their policy so that transgender students could use the bathroom of the gender with which they identify and then the school fell into a giant black hole the world is opening up god came down and he was like this is not what i meant it, it, well incorrect the pickens county only has about thirty thousand residents and almost 600 people showed up to their latest school board and there have been death threats, student oh, harassment, fuck. vandalism of school property, and the school district has reversed their policy. <gasps> Transgender students may now only use the the teacher bathroom. So there is a bathroom hmm. that um, that uh, there's single stall private bathrooms formerly formerly reserved for teachers and other staff. Now it's teachers, other staff, and the trans kids. Who, it's go ahead. It's it's the same thing happens. People are like. Oh shit, trans people in bathrooms is scary. So they do, like, cis people are doing the fucked up things. They're doing the death threats and vandalism. Like, yeah. th- th- you're causing the problem. There there wasn't a problem before. You did the fucked up shit. We should ban cis people from schools. Yeah, I agree. It's the only way to do it. <laughs> it's the only way to do it. <laughs> Divide and conquer. Segregation. Uh, separate but equal. Yeah. <laughs> But seriously, like, what Christians are obsessed with poop and pee and sex. Yeah. They're obsessed. Yeah. Obsessed. They, are, yeah. They, I, I've just been thinking so much about pedophiles <laughs> and, that, <laughs> and how it's so um, hypocritical and projection of like, oh, gay people must be the pedophiles, even though like they are proven to be, or at least the people in the institution are proven to be the pedophiles. It's the same thing of like, oh, y- you all the, are the, like, you're sex obsessed and all this stuff, and it's like, if you did nothing, literally everything would be cool. You're the one making it about sex and poop. Like, yep. sex and poop, that's the third Bible. Yep. <laughs> King James Version, the Old Testament, the New Testament, uh, and sex and poop? <laughs> there are four versions of the Bible? I think it's in the Mormon Bible, but yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah that makes sense. That's where it started. It's the Pearl of Great Price and then the poop and poop and pee. Who started uh, Mormonism? Wasn't it Joseph Gordon-Levitt? Joseph Gordon-Levitt Smith. Okay. <laughs> uh, Superintendent Carlton Wilson. Carlton? He yep. does a, such a good dance. Yep. Uh, <laughs> um, he said that he was disappointed by the anti-LGBTQ sentiments that he saw expressed by many parents at the school board meeting on Monday. Quote, the way some called names has been embarrassing and disappointing to me, and that's hard to get over. They're kids. They are all kids, and none deserve to be treated the way some of them have been treated. Yeah. So at least there's one good person in Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh. Um, so Ronan Farrow has revealed that he's engaged Ooh. to John Lovett, a dude. Not John Lovett's from SNL. Don't make that face. John Lovett, who appears to be approximately Ronan's age, based on this picture from Vanity Fair that I'm looking at. Um, John Lovett? Isn't he a singer? He hosts... I'm thinking of Lyle Lovett. Got it. He, oh, there's also Lyle. They're probably related. Yeah. His terrible hair. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> but he's one of the hosts of Pod Save America. And so he and, and Ronan Farrow are engaged to be married. Um, the journalist Ronan Farrow, uh, he included the tidbit in his new book, Catch and Kill, a Me Too expose that calls out NBC, Harvey Weinstein, and others for allegedly attempting to cover up sexual misconduct claims. Uh, he uh, Farrow won a Pulitzer Prize for reporting on Weinstein in The New Yorker. Wow. And um, he hatched a novel plan to pop the question to <laughs> love it <laughs> while he was writing the book. Quote, I'd send him a draft and put in a question right on this page. Marriage? Question mark? Pharaoh wrote per people that could have gone so badly if like he didn't read it and was like yeah I loved it, it so good okay see ya and then you're like ah shit yeah <laughs> um yeah do I ever send you stuff to like, be like get, let me get your feedback and you don't read it and you're just like yeah it's fine okay moving on oh! uh, no, <laughs> no I read every word that you write and I don't know why <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's it. That's the news. I ended with happy news. They're getting married because they're in love. Oh, right, right, right. Love. It's in his name. It. <laughs> love it. Love it. <laughs> Fuck it. Love it. Lick it. Love it. Be it. Do it. Write it. Uh, Have it. This is the modern version of Bop It. <laughs> it's, it's a metaphorical Bop It. Um, Sh- it? Should we talk about Go-Go Boys? Yeah. Go-Go. Let's go-go into our Go-Go Boys segment. I mean, Go-Go Boys and strippers... I bitched about this when we were doing our research for the show. I I feel like there's so much overlap that it's almost the same episode. The difference being we're actually talking to one this time. Yeah, I didn't think we were going to call ourselves out uh, and exp- and tell people that it was similar because that reflects poorly on our planning. But he, what, so what if we didn't do that? I have no filter. It just comes right out of my face. What if you... S- Stopped it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think anyone would think that if we were just like, we're talking about Go-Go Boys and we're going to have a Go-Go Boy on. Okay, great. We're going to talk about episodes. Go-Go Boys and we're going to have a Go-Go Boy on. Oh my God, that's so exciting. Isn't that similar to our Stripler episode? Oh no, I did it. Yep, okay. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> um, one, Steve Rodriguez. Steve Rodriguez, we were on... That Boy Hot. That Boy Hot. Um, he hosts the Talk About Gay Sex podcast. We were on his podcast. Uh, so you can go check that out. And he's about to talk to our ears. Uh, shortly. Uh, one thing I want to tell you before we do that. Okay. Is why do you look worried? I I don't know. Hmm. I don't know. Okay. You seem like you're in a mood today and I'm just wondering what evilness is bubbling under the surface. Um, no, this is podcast me is feeling great. Excited. No, no evilness. Evilness is from her personal life. So, Okay. You just have to worry about it when we turn off the mics. Okay, great. We're going to be on the air for... Get ready for a four-hour episode, kids. Here we go. (laughs) Um, There is this go-go... Well, according to this article I read, uh, go-go goddess. Gender fucking go-go goddess. Riffy royalty. Who uh, started this monthly party called Straight Acting. Okay. To make fun of that concept at all and people come in in let's see bearded boys in mini skirts and pastel wigs can celebrate their sexuality alongside female burlesque dancers trans women and men um and it's interestingly uh sponsored by scruff which is in the article it like talked about is an app that kind of pervades this straight acting idea like it's part of the problem of this uh of this culture or contributes to it or it allows a venue for people to express this so i thought that was really cool of scruff to to sponsor this yeah thanks scruff thanks scruff for being totally legit and helping out our gender queer people except with the rest of what you do um <laughs> <laughs> anything else before we talk to steve no when we get back we're gonna be talking to steve rodriguez of the talk about gay sex podcast tags podcast yeah uh cool. should, should we take a break let's take a break <laughs> let's take a break i feel like i've said that like four times today yeah what what dan 
Oh, I was going to see if there's any way. We hadn't at all plugged Patreon during the episode. Oh, yeah, that's true. Oh, Thanks. let's reverse the break. <laughs> <laughs> no break. Uh, Dan? Uh, uh, you'll have to edit around this. Do we do we want to mention that we're going to be doing the the future episode? And since that's kind of the point of me doing the, my Patreon uh, segment. Um, so I'm going to go to Scotland. Bye. While I'm in Scotland, we're going to let Dan talk more. Uh huh. And hope it doesn't go to his head. Yeah, I'm already. I already <laughs> need to think of ways to like take him down a, a peg or two. <laughs> Wink. He um, likes pegging. Yeah. I know it's going to be so difficult because so many ways. Maybe I'll just like say nice things to him and like <laughs> he'll get nothing out of it. Um. Okay. So, <laughs> so while Mike is gone, um, this has only happened one time before. We're going to have a co-host join me, guest co-host, and it's going to be Dan. Fucking Dan. Fucking Dan is going to be fucking Dan on the podcast. And we're going to talk about, uh, I'm really excited about hate crimes. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite I hate crimes. I love <laughs> hate crimes. Um, so, okay. Our Patreon segment for this week then, Dan. Yeah, it's is... inspired by that, um, sort of to help kind of as sort of a practice run of, grease the skids so to speak ew uh, why do i not like that i don't either lube, okay lube the shoot uh, <laughs> uh yeah anyway <laughs> uh it's, it's it's giving me a little practice with uh it's sort of that my favorite murder style talking about uh you know a uh, uh, a murder and um so yeah but it's go-go related Hmm. Uh, so you can check that out at, at Patreon. Patreon slash Gayish Podcast. Yeah. Uh, okay. Now, now do should we, we re re undo the rewind? <laughs> Wait, we went back. That's backwards. We got to go forward. <laughs> Now we gotta go twice because <laughs> you backed us up again. <laughs> fuck you. Oh, fuck you. Okay, let's take a break. Let's take a break. Let's take a break. 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 So are we back? We're back. <laughs> we're, we're back. We are here with Steve Rodriguez of the Tags Podcast, the Talk About Gay Sex Podcast. Steve, thanks for being here. Absolutely. We were on your podcast a week ago, two weeks ago, whenever this yeah. airs. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It was episode 125. You guys um, were kind enough to be my guest. It was so fun. Well, now you're going to be, you're on our podcast, and we're going to talk about Go Go Boys, which you were one. Exactly. Plenty of plenty to talk about on this. Um, how how long were you a go go boy, and when were you a go go boy? So I live now in New York City, but coming out of college in the early '90s, I got into go go dancing in the San Francisco area. So it was about five, a good five years, with more, you know, three three years of of really work in the scene in, in San Francisco in that 90s era. Okay, when people say something like the scene, I, like immediately what jumps to mind is drugs. Is that fair or unfair of me to just automatically um, assume that? I don't know if it's fair or unfair, but it definitely wasn't. The scene I'm talking about, and if you can harken back to like the, the 90s, at least in San Francisco, we had such a vibrant scene to go out in. In other words, the big clubs were still having their heyday, that, that kind of warehouse club scene mm. that definitely doesn't really exist in San Francisco anymore. And many of these spots, and I'm including this in the scene, had go-go boys. So once I got on that circuit of being hired as a dancer and at one point, I worked with a friend of mine who was a promoter for a club called Club Asia. And he made me, I got to hire the dancers as well. So for me, the scene was that. But amongst all that, of course, you know, you could imagine the 90s, there was of drugs and everything. I tended to be a kind of a goody goody. <laughs> like I'm probably a little <laughs> more like crazier today than I was back then. I mean, I ran around town with my roller board suitcase with all my costumes in tightly knit ziploc bags and went to the gym before and i mean i think maybe i had get, a couple so they got good pump 
for while you're dancing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And then maybe had a couple margaritas at best, and that was that was kind of like the you know the it for me. So auditioning Go Go Boys is like my dream job. But first, I want to back up a little bit. Uh, uh, how do you get involved in that scene? Like, who does somebody just come up to you and be like, "You should be naked for money"? I did get approached from a photographer who's still San Francisco prominent name by the name of Stephen Underhill. He definitely did approach me in a cafe, and I think it was Cafe Floor, which is still there, by the way. Mm-hmm. Great place to, you know, kind of the Hollywood story of sitting at the diner, <laughs> um, getting picked up that way. Uh, you should be a star type thing. <laughs> and he definitely found me and photographed me that many of the photographs ended up in, at the time, I think he had a boy next door calendar that it made it in that. Uh, some of the pictures that he took of me ended up in some of the rags of the day. The, the club rags and so on and so forth. And from that, you, you get noticed, at least in San Francisco, I did as being somebody that's modeling with their shirt off that you could probably be um, good at go-go dancing. And then in my case, the other thing was I was a gymnast in college and throughout my years and, and a dancer. So I already knew how to dance and figured I could do this. And it was just another performance if you will that you know i think i've thought i could do Uh, okay on the like someone approaching you to take pictures like that's awesome that it was like ended up being a reputable reputable person went well but i feel like that could be the like start of you know episode of svu like (laughs) (laughs) hold on i'm I'm on amazon getting a dslr camera so i can just go up to randos and say take your shirt off (laughs) (laughs) I had some, one of my best friends who's still one of my best friends today, who I think I was just talking about him, had a club and he is, was 20 years older than me and definitely kind of steered me clear of the crazies (laughs) out there that could have been preying on the young and impressionables. So I had a, a, and then I had a, a best friend of mine. We were college buddies. We went to Berkeley together we became workout partners, roommates, and both kind of got into the dance scene at the same time. He also got photographed a lot too. So we could kind of bounce things off each other to see if, okay, is this a good idea? Should we do this gig or is this guy? You Com- know. Compare notes about who's skeezy. Exactly. <laughs> and if I would say anything, you know, have a support system, develop a, a crew, a family a created family that has your best interests at heart. I mean, back in those days, at best we had was a pager. So yeah. you can imagine if you got a page from your best friend, it was like, oh shoot, where's the nearest pay phone? Did you ever end up in like sketchy situations? Like what's the sketchiest thing that you can think of? You know, it's weird. I had more of a sketchier situation as an actor when I mm. later moved out to LA with the whole kind of Me Too movement, lascivious manager situation. All of my go-go dancing experiences, I would have to say, were all pretty positive. Now, I mean, did I see things, you know, sex happening backstage, which I don't know if it's lascivious or or bad, but... Did you ever end up at Brian Singer's pool party is the question, I think. (laughs) Yeah, I I had my own experience in LA. I didn't end up there and probably glad I didn't. But yeah, no, nothing that was really that horrible. Most experiences were, were pretty positive, including... And by the way, I was a go go boy dancer where... We would go to the large clubs. Oftentimes, we'd be on huge podium type structures. Yeah. And the lights were on us. Other times, there was a, a go go pole at a couple bars. I think the N Touch had a really cool traditional style go go boy. But it was there that I actually got approached by someone to do like a birthday party, which I had no idea. But I accepted the gig. The money was going to be good. And it required me to be more of a stripper, if you will. Yeah. yeah. I'd show up at someone's house 
And I think I brought like a boom box with music. And <laughs> this yeah. sounds like a movie or it's TV magic show. Mike. It's or... magic Mike. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. I came with, but again, and came out of the, you know, met in the garage with the guy who had the house and he gave me the lowdown on who the birthday boy was and what I was going to do and when to come out of the bedroom to come out as sort of like a fi- the fireman stripping my clothes off and performing, which I did a good job and they paid really well. But again, it was that same friend, my friend that was 20 years older, that really he drove me over to the party and said, you call me when you're done, practically mm-hmm. waited outside in his VW bug. And so I felt like I had a good, you know, angel looking over me that I, everything turned out okay. Is, is there like a that kind of support system or like kind of mentorship feeling in the community or is that just some, you know, you happen to find someone that that uh, could look out for you? I think I had I I just developed my own support system, which I imagine so many guys do these days, you know, you have to. We kind of you have your own family, your regular family, and in my case, I wasn't about to call mom and dad, who <laughs> had just helped support me to go to Berkeley, to say, oh, and by the way, now I'm, you know, dancing at a house party with my clothes off. I don't think that would have flown too well in my Latino background. Um, so did or, you did you keep it a secret? Did your family know? Did you talk to your family about it? Definitely not my mom and dad. I just avoided that. And I later on, I told my sister and my sister is we're best friends and she's extremely open minded. And later on, she actually would come and see me at different gigs. And, oh, wow. and so from that, I did have that sort of family support but it wasn't as though i was telling her oh by the way i'm at this gig tomorrow night i'm there it was just when it it happened i utilized more of my support system and my the family that i had cultivated on my own to kind of be look out for me yeah what i mean i can i can imagine but i'm curious to hear from you why did you choose not to share that with your family and what what do you think the risk was if you did well like i said i'm from a Hispanic, Latin, Latino, Mexican family and old school too. So my parents grew up in the fifties and were very, not conservative, but I went to Catholic school. And so I didn't really come out until really later on in life. And you can imagine if you haven't come out, the last thing you're is going to come out as a go-go dancer at a gay <laughs> bar. So I think for years and years, it was just easier to avoid the whole coming out process. It was a different era, different time. And like I said, my Catholic and Latino background sh- certainly didn't help. So that was probably the reason. <laughs> So no no judgments whatsoever, and I'm curious to know, there seems to be, the people that I know, there's a fine line between go-go and dipping into porn. Was that ever a thing? That, or sex work is something in my mind yeah. that it's, there's a potential. Yeah, was, was that a hard line for you? Was there blurring there? Yeah, believe it or not, and interestingly enough, San Francisco has a vibrant porn production company, you know, shoot system around there. There's several porn companies in San Francisco, but for whatever reason that none of that ever came my way. And I just think for me, I looked at go-go dancing and the stripping that I did as, you know, making extra money, helping me through my final years of college. And for me, I had in my mind, I had my mindset that I was going to be moving to LA and getting into acting. And Go-go dancing, I always assumed, you know, no one really had cameras, no one had iPhones. Yeah. And even if somebody had found that out, now remember, we're talking the 90s, it's not like (laughs) what it is today, so keep that in mind, that, you know, Ellen, I'm not sure if Ellen had come out, so if you had done porn or the thinking back then that you were gay, a gay man, or had done porn, it would have your career would have ended before it started in acting. Yeah. So with my mind already set that I was headed towards Hollywood with stars in my eyes, <laughs> I felt like I that was never even an option. And no, no one ever really, for whatever reason, approached me for that. But I feel like if they had, they did, I would have just 
you know, politely said, oh, I'm not interested because it would ruin my career. So mm. for the career I thought I was going to have. Okay. I know we're talking about go-go boys, but I want to go to the, like uh, on the acting side, you said like you got into a little bit of the me too ish things. Can you tell us anything about yes. shitty acting situations? I mean, so much. Again, it's, oh, no. the, it's the mid. Well, now it's. I moved in 1998, moved in with a friend, and he actually hooked me up with this manager. The manager at the time was the manager for Sean Hayes of Will and Grace. Sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and an actress. Uh, Cloris Leachman, she was an older yeah. actress. Yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, you know, these were like good credits that I was thinking, well, great. You know, this is, this manager certainly has some actors behind his belt. Multiple and... names you recognize. This guy is not a schlub. Yeah. Right, right. And so he had put me in some, I got hooked up with him and he put, put me in some acting classes and I was going on some auditions and we would go to the Will and Grace tapings and it was you know, so all of that was exciting, but this person had an underside to him that, you know, after one of those screenings or whenever we'd go out, somehow we'd end up at his apartment and somehow we'd end up on his waterbed of all things, <laughs> right? Oh. On the corner of La Cienega and Santa Monica and a hand would start slipping over his way. And I just started to, obviously I knew what was going on, but I started to think, wow, I can't believe this, I'm using air quotes, casting couch situation is real and happening to me now. And you can just imagine with your new and fresh, just the mind fuck that it can have on you. Because in one sense, you realize, wow, this guy has credits. He certainly has gotten, you know, known actors work. And I'm pretty sure they didn't maybe go through this, but why am I? Hmm. And like, I, I think the only way to describe it was it was a mind fuck in so many ways. Um, I, I want to ask more, but I also want to respect any boundaries you may have. I'm no, no, you can ask away. <laughs> okay. Did, like how far did it go then? Show me on the doll where he touched you. I, well, a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, just to keep reiterating the mind fuck, I mean, I think I was confused at the time and let him do a little bit, but I always kind of stopped it before we were like naked or anything a hundred percent. But I would, I would let it go so far and then kind of just politely kind of move aside. And that dance that we played went on for months. Um, for a while, really, until finally I just realized, you know, enough of this. I don't want to work with this person anymore. It wasn't worth it. And quite honestly, I don't think he was getting me the right acting coaches and the right agents that were good for me. And he even went so far as to say things, you know, you would probably have more, uh, you would do better in your castings. Maybe if we had a chin implant <gasps> and maybe if you, I mean, yeah, really like telling me different ways that I could change my look even. And I was really, you know, again, new to the scene and quite impressionable and didn't really believe it, but of course messed with my mind until finally I just decided, okay, I need to start from scratch. I need to just really do this on my own, whether that means I have no help for a while and just start putting my headshots in. There's a thing called Backstage West where you just submit yourself like every other actor. And I just kind of went to square one for myself. And long story short on this person, uh, Sean Hayes ended up uh, having a whole court case system against him and suing him for something unrelated. I think it had to do with man, uh, financial mismanagement and won the case. So wow. people can look up who they, <laughs> Sean Hayes and that former manager. I, I was going to say, you name. haven't said his name, but. I have not said his name, but you can do the math if you really care or are interested in that. But I'm, yeah. So. I, I'm, I'm sort of curious if, if it weren't for that power dynamic and that totally inappropriate relationship, uh, would you have been into him? Like is, was, was he, was he your type? at all or no. so I, I mean <laughs> no definitely not and there was a 
in addition, there was a swarminess. I don't think I think that's a word. It's, sure, it yeah. is now. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay, swarminess <laughs> to him, a seediness to him that I didn't. I'm kind of always the prayish kind of side to him that was didn't you know always rub me the wrong way and now he's john waters in my head i can't stop seeing that <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. yeah i mean i love john waters but you know and john waters has such a great hilarious personality this guy did not have that and this guy had beady eyes if you know what i mean <laughs> <laughs> that really paints a picture beady eyes yeah and that's beady eyes, that's I remember and I can it seems like there's a false sense of security that that provides knowing he has these credentials he's legit so that or or seemingly legit I, yeah no definitely and that world Hollywood LA I didn't have any any background to base anything off of I mean I I guess the only thing I would say is I'm kind of glad I got it out of the way early on in my time in Hollywood so that I could the whole casting couch concept, I learned, okay, it's a reality and kind of got that out of the way early on. So then I could just strip it all away. <laughs> that to use a <laughs> term that we're talking about today and just kind of start from scratch. It really surprises me because in my head, um, promoters and club owners are the skeezy of the skeezy and that you would get that kind of, you know, power differential unwanted forward aggressive behavior from them and you're, you're saying you didn't though not at all i mean again a friend of like i said a friend of mine he got he worked for macy's as his day job and through these clubs at night that i ended up helping him hire the dancers for did he work as a go-go boy at macy's <laughs> he did not no he did not. now that i think about it that might bring brick and mortar back okay <laughs> right. sorry yeah <laughs> something that he needs to do something to bring that back yeah <laughs> but no I, I think that all of the people even the the club owners i can think of a few or, or sorry the bar owners that had go-go dancers back then you know they weren't the it was definitely a, they were a bar club owner but we always got paid when we were told we were going to get paid we got the right amount of money i never experienced any patrons getting out of control but if they did there was always security there that would cart them out nothing for whatever reason i think there's a lot of misconceptions of go-go boys and strippers and i know we talked about it on my the episode you guys guessed on briefly but there's that current documentary out all male all new johnson's about a current stripper bar in the fort lauderdale area and they really profile all these dancers and for the most part 90 percent of them they are all they've got lives outside of there and are just kind of it's just another gig hmm. it's an adult gig but there's not a whole lot of horror stories from that, like you would think. So yeah. there's the there's a spectrum of gigs, I imagine. And on one one extreme, there's the look but don't touch, and and then it's somewhere in the middle is the okay touch but don't grope, and then at the at the other end is the like just no holds barred, feel free to molest the dancers. And it, it sounds like your gigs were mostly that first that first end, that more just look but don't touch sort of area. Is that is that true? Yeah, right. And I, there's so many, it's so interesting that there is so many different layers of go-go boys and strippers. And there is apparently a difference between the two. And like I said, for the most part, I was a go-go boy. So oftentimes so high up on these podiums that it was even hard to reach us. We were more kind of atmospheric entertainment uh, reigning above the crowd as your entertainment source. And the few times that I did dance at bars where we were kind of closer to the to the audience or people and they would come up and, you know, load your hopefully load up your G string jock strap with <laughs> dollar bills or hopefully more. <laughs> um, you know, I think that people were you could touch and feel and, and so forth, not necessarily like your my genitals, but people were pretty respectful of all that. Mm -hmm. And even the place where I danced called Club Asia that my friend ran, we, we were really close to the floor and we would do these performances. So we had one that we borrowed from Bangkok, Thailand of all places, that was called the Candle Wax Dance. 
And essentially, we would rub olive oil all over each other, which mm-hmm. me and the other dancers, <laughs> yeah. It was such a like really hot thing. We would, well, we would put a tarp kind of over the whole stage because imagine we're run, dripping wax and all of that. So we kind of protected that. And then this whole first part, we'd have the DJ play really sexy, hard core house music that would go along with us rubbing olive oil all over each each other's body and then we would almost like a seance if you will we would light (laughs) these candles and get into different configurations where we were dripping wax over each other but the olive oil protected your skin so you wouldn't burn it still stung but you weren't actually burning the skin but you can imagine so many people like watching this was their jaws were dropped like oh my god this is crazy and then we would make it interactive where we'd hand the candles to audience members and they could drip it on us so it was really erotic and i guess interactive if if you will where was this event does it happen every year (laughs) we're we're gonna get tickets (laughs) well we don't do it anymore somebody should bring this back to anybody listening out there dancers because these days when i see dancers it's like move side to side and there's so many cool things you could be doing but you could go uh mike to bangkok and they actually do it that's where we stole it from Mm -hmm. the only difference was i think they did it to themselves so in other words they would Put a dancer would just put olive oil on his body and then kind of erotically drip it over himself. We sort of made it where we were dripping it over each other and the wrestling bit of like the rubbing olive oil and getting entangled over each other's body, I think made it more interactive. And then obviously handing candles to the audience, really interactive. Can you describe everything you just did again slower? <laughs> and just, just That's the after show. No, okay. Um, so you've mentioned, you know, kind of where you were in time in the 90s. Um, and nowadays, I see so many go-go boys that then also have an Instagram or people can take videos of them when they're, whenever they want. What are your feelings about you know, do you do you wish that was the case to get out there more, or are you glad people didn't video every uh, thing that you did? I think I'm glad that we didn't have all those because those you know the cameras and the phones. At least in that era, I wouldn't have wanted that to get out there so much because I would have thought, I know I would have thought that this could potentially diminish and ruin any chance I have of ever getting started as an actor in Hollywood. So. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I think that's totally different today or these days. I think, you know, all these, it, it almost doesn't scar your career anymore. And certainly people are out and having thriving acting careers. And so the other thing is I liked the fact that it people were in the moment. So people's phones weren't up. It was, it was what it was. So if you were out and I was dancing and I was looking around at people and they were tipping me, People were focused on having a good time and we were their entertainment and everything was really in the moment and it was what it was. I don't think anybody took it too seriously. It just was a fun release that everybody was sharing in where these days, you know, I'll go out sometimes and I'll be looking over at the next guy and he's got his scruff open Mm -hmm. or his grinder and I'm like, well, you are at a bar right now. Can you not pay attention to what's going on here. Yeah. Now, mind you, I've had some friends or my my co-host, Jeremy, tell me that, well, sometimes they're on their phone because they're trying to see who else is in this bar that maybe they can connect with. So, I mean, there's that too. Yeah. <laughs> um. So I feel very uncomfortable with, like, with Go-Go Boys. We talked about this on your show as well. Like, I even, tr- like, I look but try not to, stare too much or I like the idea of walking up and tipping someone to touch them even if I would want to is very uncomfortable to me so maybe you can help me out how does it feel on your end to have people staring at you people touching you what's that what's that feeling like I mean my job or my job was as a dancer or a go-go boy was to entertain and if I wasn't if I'm not Part of that job is to be looking out in the crowd and particularly when you're lower to the ground or you're on a strip pole, 
a, you're not just doing it for your health, you're doing <laughs> it. And typically most of these bars and clubs, or even back then, you, you, would got, you would get a little bit of money per dance. So I think we got three sets for $75, so $25 a set. So you're not making like a ton of money. So you bank on, on your tips. And so if you're banking on your tips, then you know you really need to connect with your audience and connect with people. And there's a connection where I think where you're looking into the audience, but then you want to be approachable at the same time. So it's that fine line of trying to trying to be seductive, <laughs> but also not being so off-putting, making yourself uh, appealing that you people would want to come up to you, be approachable. Mm. And when you can do that and calm people down like, oh yeah, no, I'm cool. And if you can get them to come up to you, you can strike up a quick conversation and just let them know that you're just a regular person just like them. And that typically can relax the person that we're no different. It's just that I happen to be up here and you're down there and I don't really have any clothes on and <laughs> you do, but we can fix that by just putting a dollar in my, you know, <laughs> and it doesn't bite. <laughs> but once you understand the rules of that game or that performance, that one just happens to be you in a thong. And, <laughs> and it's, but then you get the lights and, you know, it's not like you're in bright lights and you've got, you know, the smoke and, and the music and all of that creates a vibe and a mood. And I think you, you get into it and you get into that mode and, and, no, I never had problems with that. I just think it was. And you know that the people that are coming there that are looking at you are appreciative of that. And it's all fantasy and fun. So, yeah, I didn't ever have a, a feel uncomfortable about it. So one of the rumors out there that we've talked about on our show several times is that Go-Go Boys are straight or at least say that they're straight. Um, what, what's your experience? Like just from your Google boy friends, uh, how many of them say that first of all, and second of all, how many of them are actually straight? Yeah, I would say it's a good 50, 50, but even back when I was dancing in the mid nineties, they're a good friend of mine. Uh, well, I had my best friend at the time who was a fellow dancer who was gay like myself, but then we would dance with another guy and he was totally straight. But in one way, I really liked it because he was provocative and great on stage and he had his thing. But it was nice having a straight friend in that world that was doing the same thing I was. So for me, I kind of felt good about it, too, that it wasn't just all us, at least in my mindset, us gay boys that are doing this. I kind of liked having the camaraderie that I probably wouldn't have had just on my own. I didn't have a lot of straight friends. Hmm. So I kind of liked that we were both in this world together doing this after hours, dark, you know, gig. And it made it fun for me. Nowadays, when I go out, there's a lot of stripper type bars, the bars where, you know, you'll see them, maybe they perform. And I know like in Montreal, there's a bunch of bars and they perform. And then you can go into a back room if you pay them a fee, and I think it's anywhere from $20 on up per song, where you kind of, you get your cubicle, and they're literally lap dancing on top of you, and who knows what else goes on, but <laughs> in those, I never did that kind of dancing, I, mean, I that would be um, I don't, a little challenging for me, I'm not sure I would have been into that, I like going to those kinds of places as a patron, but in my experience every time I go with one of those they typically always are straight half like nine times out of ten and I don't know why that is the case but it seems to be strippers tend to be uh, straight in my experience did you dance at gay clubs straight clubs or both I strictly did gay I don't think there was as many straight clubs that had go-go dancers at the time we did have a few women like uh that became good friends of mine not a lot like we would have 90 percent men guys gay and straight but we had a couple that i thought they added a lot of you know mixture to the whole the whole night i wanted to 
ask, I hope this isn't too uncomfortable, but like uh, when I when I go to I, I've been to the Abbey in, at WeHo and it's pretty much all white guys dancing with, with blonde hair and they're jacked. Like that seems to be what I've noticed there. And then all the way on the other end of the spectrum, when I went to Houston, I went to Tony's Corner Pocket and it, the, most of the strippers were people of color. I, I was I was wondering if you being a person of color, if you experienced any difficulties or uh, if you were excluded at all, um, just just because you weren't the white gym bunny. Yeah, I really did it. Interestingly enough, I mean, uh, San Francisco, I think, has always been a melting pot, super multicultural, every ethnicity. And I don't know, maybe we were kind of in a bubble, even in that 90s era that most of my fellow, I, I think I talked about my best friend at the time, fellow dancer, was also uh, Mexican-American like myself. Uh, the straight guy I was just mentioning a second ago is Latino. We had a mixture of white, like I said, women, which was really refreshing. Um, but I mean, I, I know other cities often, like you said, in WeHo, it can have a certain prototype even to this day, I would argue, which is interesting. But yeah, I didn't experience that as much, which was good. You've never experienced racism and everything's totally cool. That's great to hear. So I'll hear that. <laughs> okay, no, I didn't say that. <laughs> I experienced more about my, uh, relating to my, uh, my look and being ethnic. Oh, believe me, I have stories for you galore. <laughs> We don't have enough time for that. And definitely in the acting world, for sure. It's so but it, in this microcosmic time frame when I was a dancer, and again, three to five years, roughly, a little bit of a blur, I didn't have experienced that very much. It's so interesting because, I mean, I'm, and I know Mike already said it, but kind of my picture, my stereotype of go-go boys and clubs are that they would be the place where... Uh, you'd have racism, you'd have uh, people trying to get you into uncomfortable situations. And it's the the place, the acting or other areas that are supposed to be above board that are the places you experience it. It's just a, a interesting dynamic of what you would expect versus what you'd actually get um, from those two different worlds. I mean, it is interesting. And, and I'm sure there are plenty of story that somebody could come on here and talk about the stripper go-go boy world. So it's not to say that there isn't, yeah. but maybe because there is so much, like you kind of know what you're getting. People, the bar club owners that I've certainly known throughout the years in general are, they're doing what they love. It's, it's nightlife. They still have to abide by a lot of laws and they're oftentimes more likely to get shut down or be on alert by the authorities given the nature that they have a, a, an after hours uh, club or a night club and so they're already on high alert to to try and do the right thing in general and it just kind of goes down the line half the time that you know I think yeah they're going to have strippers and you're going to have people with scantily clad clothes on but everybody knows what we're getting into where hollywood and all that is still sex does sell in that world but there's this whole idea that it's it, you know we're doing everyone's doing good but i think behind the scenes there's a lot more stories i think that are lascivious it seems like the um being in the go-go boy world Things are very direct and open about what what people are want, what what they're there for. Versus, it sounds like Hollywood and acting. People know what they want, but they're not willing to be direct about. Like, you need to look like this. They're they're almost trying to pretend like they're something they're not. Exactly, exactly. I think that you hit it hit it on the head with that one. Um, you talked about. Oh, thank you. I'm so smart. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, you are. Uh, um, okay. Olive oil candles. That's the sexiest thing I can think of. What other either sexy, crazy, unexpected experiences uh, can you share with us? I'm trying to think. You know, so much of it back then was the the costumes that we wore. The funny thing is I had a lot of leather accessories in the whole BDSM culture. And, you know, years later, more in my 
here in New York, I've gotten actually into some of the leather scene. I entered a Mr. Ego contest, you know, five or six years ago. But back then I had a lot of that paraphernalia, but I didn't know the first thing about leather. Couldn't tell you anything, but I certainly had it to wear because it, in that time it was all costume. Hmm. And we acted out scenes on stage that were fun, but I don't know that any of us really were a part of that scene. It was all just smoke and mirrors and for show. Yeah. How'd you do but in the Mr. Eagle competition? I, I was runner up the year wow. I entered. So not bad. Yeah. Congrats. Yeah. It was a fun experience in general, just to to leading up to it. I, I don't regret it. Um, we did the other dance that we did that was kind of a lot of fun that we also imported from Bangkok, who knew, right, <laughs> was the towel dance. And you can imagine just that we would go out and a look and then we'd strip down and then we'd pick up these towels and we were clearly making it obvious they were taking our jock straps or G-strings off underneath. Mm. And we were pretty low to the floor, but you could kind of get a look or we would just put the towel in our front side and you could see the back of us. And we had a lot of fun as performers during that, but my co-dancers would always laugh at me because they said, every time you bend over to show them your butt, people can see your balls on the other side. Do you, <laughs> do you not know what you're doing right now? And I was like, oh, I didn't know that. But then it became a thing like, oh, well, but that's okay. I don't mind showing that. <laughs> It'll be my thing. But <laughs> balls. Balls. It, yeah, you could see it from the other end, and so the whole dick, and yeah, and I was like, oh, okay, I didn't realize that, but hey, if it makes me a f an extra buck, or <laughs> I'm all for it. Do uh, you have time for a couple of listener questions? Sure. Yeah, we, we tweeted out that we were going to be talking to a go-go dancer and, and uh, got a couple of, of questions. So, uh, number one, how often are go-go boys padded versus all natural? Padded, you mean like... Yeah, I'm like some... Like, like, some I, go to, like I go to some places and there's always like one or two dancers that's like, sweet Jesus, what have you put in there? Because that, there's no way that's a dick. But maybe maybe it is. Maybe there's just some giant ass dicks out there. There are some giant ass dicks out there, I would argue. Mm -hmm. And we do have tricks of the trade, as you can imagine. Mine was always the uh, cock ring that mm -hmm. you could fluff up even more. And if anyone knows anything about a cock ring takes the blood, gets the blood going when you get it somewhat excited and kind of my, that was my push up bra moment, <laughs> if you will. And it just helped. You couldn't do anything for the butt because you either had it or you didn't because you're either wearing a thong, which you can just see the cheeks or a jock strap. So you, you have what you got there. You definitely worked out a lot harder. Like I talked about earlier at the gym earlier to get that final pump hopefully you're working out during the week leading up to the gig but mine was always that now i've heard of a couple other dancers that'll tie off their dick so i have a friend of mine who's a current dancer here in new york and it looks like his dick is gargantuan i mean it's like an eiffel in his thong <laughs> and i've seen it outside of it and it's nice size but it's certainly not what you would think but Apparently, he gets a condom and cuts the end of it and literally ties it off and it engorges it so much. But I've told him huh. before, are you in danger of like, he's like, oh, no, uh, Steve, I've got about 30 minutes before I have to go take it off. And I thought, you mean 30 minutes before it turns blue? And, <laughs> and, and where, by the way, is your stopwatch? And are we timing this? So I feel like walking around with him and going, what time are we at yet? Are, like, do we need to go cut it off? I mean, not cut the dick off, but cut the dick off? <laughs> or where are we? And he's easy breezy about it all. Uh, and then I have a former a friend here that also used to be a dancer. And he showed me this penis that is meant to kind of stuff your pants with. And it's, it, it was kind of weird. It was this, it was rubber, but it felt kind of like a dick. And you can literally, he said he used to just kind of put it in there to kind of plump everything out up. But I don't know. For me, we had a bunch of gigs where I didn't mind if they kind of went down there and, you know, touched that through the thong. But I needed them to be touching my real thing. I would feel weird if they were touching a prosthetic or something that wasn't me. Yeah. 
Uh, and then one more one more question from a listener. What is the most unique trick you've seen a dancer do? Sometimes I'll see some dancers and they're doing backflips on stage and they're in handstands that I'm always like. And as a former gymnast, I'm thinking, wow, I, I wouldn't do this on a stage because I'd be worried I'd you know, knock the chandelier out or hit somebody in the head with my boot. Or there's leftover olive oil on the stage. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I could just see, you know, accident waiting to happen. And my mind is always on that. But some of these guys that have poles, you know, pole dancing bars, I'm always impressed when they can go upside down and link their legs. And they're really creative. And, and clearly, they have a ton of core strength that I'm always impressed with and kind of awestruck over them. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah. We're going to take a break then. Yeah. Let's take a break. Cool. Let's, let's take a break. Break. <laughs> this is the part where Mike and Kyle take a break. So are we back? We're back. We're back. Uh, we're going to do our gayest and straightest. We're going to do our gayest and straightest. But first, but Steve first. Rodriguez of Tags, tell us where we can find more information about you and what you're up to. Absolutely. So Tags Podcast, a.k.a. Talk About Gay Sex. We come out every Tuesday on every single podcast platform. Check us out. We, you can follow us at Tags, T-A-G-S Podcast on all social media or just go to tagspodcast.com and you can get the show from there. And I would just suggest going to their Instagram. Just, you know. Just, just cause. check. Just there's, <laughs> at tags podcast. I, have, at, at tags podcast, I right? won't add any more. Just check them out. Uh-huh. Um, well, our website is gayishpodcast dot com. Uh, our all our social media: Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube is at gayish podcast. Um, I, quick reminder: our Facebook group is private, so nobody can see that you joined. They can't see what you or anybody else posts there. I have had some people; the, the things that they have said to me lead me to believe that they don't know that. So, oh. if you're if you're worried about joining our group being something that will out you, it won't, and that's not how it works. Are you sure? Uh, how, like, does that show up anywhere on your? Uh... No. Oh, okay. It doesn't. Okay. Okay, great. Our hotline, you can send us text messages or leave us voicemails as 5855-GAYISH. That's 585-542-9474. Standard rate supply. And our email is gayishpodcast at gmail.com. So let's do our gayest and straightest. Let's do our gayest and straightest. Steve, do you want to kick us off? Sure. I So I'm just talked about Tags Podcast and we're in the middle of shooting, or we're going to shoot uh, this Saturday, our pilot. And it's all about gay sex. So I am immersed right now in talking and planning all things gay from my monologue to gay subject matter. And I mean, it's a lot of fun. I'm I'm just totally gay, 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 gay. And on the straight, should I say the straightest thing too? Oh, sure. Wait, uh, where? Oh, wait. Okay, go ahead. For for the pilot you're shooting, where's that? Where can people find that? So we're shooting it and just going to produce a really good pilot and take the rest of the year to uh, edit it. And then we're shopping it around beginning in January. So Mm -hmm. I'll have more information on that. Okay. Yeah. Let us know where that ends up and where people can check it out in the future. Absolutely. And how about your straightest this week or of recent memory? The straightest thing is also the same thing. So when you're producing (laughs) something, I'm doing all the gay stuff for content wise, but I'm also working on the production side of things as a crew member and working with the cameras and the lights and the techie nitty gritty stuff and working with a lot of straight folks on the production side, which I love that too. So it's getting my geeky production crew hat on that to me can feel like straight. Yeah. 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 Totally. Um, (laughs) my, uh, gayest is that um, I was out at a bar uh, this past Friday and someone complimented me on the Britney shirt I was wearing and I was like, thanks. And then was like, you know what? I want more of this. I ordered a couple new Britney shirts and coasters that say, oops, I'm drinking again. <laughs> That's really gay. I know. <laughs> I'm very excited. I think they my Amazon package just arrived. Um, my straightest is I was talking to our favorite fag tag, Doug and Koviak, um, one of my friends and coworkers, and he was telling me about the uh, engagement shower gifts that he started to receive, including what he called a chip and dip, which is like 
for chips and dip. And it's just like, I feel like straight people have all these things to make themselves feel better about what they're doing or appear fancier. It's like, did you know? To be a couch potato. I know. Yeah. Like, did you know that chip bags come in a self-serving container and it's the bag? Like, you don't need to add (laughs) any more layers of items. It seems like they invent things just to give each other at showers. That's just lazy. (laughs) That's mine. Mike? Oh, geez. Well, the straightest thing about me this week, um, I don't know why I think it's so straight. Maybe it's because it's mostly straight bros that do it, but I went to an improv show last week um and our friend matt who's a straight dude did Mm -hmm. his one man show about his eighth grade biography it was adorable but it was like i think kyle and i were the only gay people in the whole room yeah probably (laughs) um and then the gayest thing about me this week i went on a daniel radcliffe bender (laughs) (laughs) what does that include (laughs) uh so i i watched uh i watched the movie horns from 2013 and i watched the movie swiss army man from 2016 and it started just as like i wanted to see his furry chest because apparently harry potter grew up and got kind of hot a little bit um Mm. and then and then they turned out to be really good movies but it definitely started because i was like i want to see i want to see how naked he gets in these two movies (laughs) I love it. That's pretty gay. <laughs> uh, is that it? Yes, so that's it. A special thank you to Steve Rodriguez from the Tags Podcast. Steve, thanks again so much for being here. Thank you so much, Kyle and Mike. I loved this. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you to Joe and Dallas for submitting that question so I could ask about dicks. <laughs> <laughs> no, that makes so much sense now that you say it. <laughs> thanks, Joe. Uh, and thanks to Ronan Farrell for looking like Frank Sinatra. <laughs> It'll make sense when we do the news. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, That's it. This has been Gayish. I'm Mike Johnson. I'm Kyle Getz. Until next week, be butch, be fabulous for you. See you next week. Go, go, go. (laughs) (laughs) That whole, like, hot wax olive oil thing like holy shit (laughs) let's make let's make that happen